today's scripture reading is from Ecclesiastes, verse 4, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one. Chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur. As some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Let us pray. God, please speak to us through Crystal. Touch our hearts so that we may love better and become more like you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry to always start with Al, but he's my best material. <laughs> During a week or two leading up to my preaching, I talk over the scriptures and the topic with Al sometimes at length. And so yesterday, Al already knew what I was thinking about. So when he was getting ready for work, he said, is there anything you need before I go? And I said, yeah, a sermon. <laughs> Being a helpful always is, he said, in the beginning, there was one. And God said, let there be two. And there was the first group, the small group. <laughs> But he's right, formed for love and companionship, partners in work and fulfilling God's command to reproduce and fill the earth, the family is the first small group. Our core value today is small groups, and Lisa's going to put it up on the screen. The narrative tells us and how they work. Haynes Presbyterian Church seeks to be a community where small groups are a vital tool to fulfill one another. We believe the command to love and build one another up in the faith is fulfilled through small groups that include worship, fellowship, Bible study, service, and evangelism. If you've ever been to a large church, it's easy to get lost in the crowd, never even connect with anyone. Mega churches almost have to utilize small groups, otherwise how could they be responsible for discipling thousands? Too many people would slip through the cracks. You know how they say that you can feel lonely in a big city with all those people around? Sometimes there are so many people, not even one of them knows you. But you'd be surprised. Or be really known. I don't know how many of you listen to the local radio, but Al does a weekly safety report about fire and EMS topics. His companions would be along and you'd help him. It's not good for people to be alone. Isn't it remarkable that in the very beginning, way back in Genesis, 
God created the world, and it was good, and it was good, and it was very good. But he looked at the man, and he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Adam had fellowship with God. There was no fall into sin yet, and yet God saw there was something missing. Adam needed human companionship. We are designed to be in community. The writer of Ecclesiastes agrees. A person alone is in desperate straits if something bad happens. He falls down, the weather turns cold, an enemy comes up upon him. When there are two, they can help each other, they can keep warm, put up a strong front. But one alone is in trouble. So thank God. He provides companions for us along the way. It is his grace that we don't walk through life alone. Maybe we're not all married or have children and grandchildren, but we have friends, neighbors, Christian brothers and sisters to do life with. So here we are in church worshiping together. But our model of worship with its pastor leaders and liturgy doesn't allow for a lot of give and take, getting to know each other, encouraging each other, or caring for each other's needs. And even though I love our worship service, it does make it easy for one to be unnoticed, possibly even left with unmet needs. Last week was so fun to hear our congregation's testimonies real stories of our God working in people's lives to heal and restore us to the image of God. But those opportunities don't come up often in our worship services, and in my experience, not even in our informal times of fellowship. Most of what I hear in conversation after church is ordinary chit-chat, like you have with anyone in the grocery store or the post office. It's nice and friendly, but not particularly inspiring or spiritual. We know each other are Christian brothers or sisters. We take it for granted, but we do not share much about what God is doing in our lives or how we're growing in faith or which scriptures we're struggling with. So we need a place, a small group, where we can forge spiritual friendship the kind that promotes spiritual growth and allows for accountability. Small groups are interactive and personal. To that end, they can be very small, three or four, even just two people discipling each other. They could be bigger, maybe up to eight or ten, but we need to be able to get to know each one in the group and build trust among you. So you don't want to get a group too big. And what is the nature of the groups? Well, when we chose these core values, a committee of the congregation had been meeting for months to come up with an accurate description of our church, including new mission and vision statements. Do you remember what they are? They are right on the front of your bulletin every week. Our vision is that people in our congregation will know, live, share Jesus. And that's a great way to remember what small groups are working toward. First, we know Jesus. That is, we study the Gospels and the rest of the biblical record together, learning God's truth, claiming his promises, heeding his warnings. We learn from each other as we read the scriptures, listening for the Holy Spirit's guidance and wisdom to give us knowledge. We get to know Jesus by meeting and praying together, remembering that where the church is gathered, he is there or here. We get to know God better by hearing testimonies from one another, where each of one saw God at work during the week or weeks in between meetings. And we experience his presence by worshiping God in song and praise, even in a small group. This is all, of course, reinforced in the Sunday morning worship as well, but in our smaller gatherings, it can be a little more personal and interactive. Then we live Jesus. As our groups grow in friendship and trust, 
we will have opportunity to encourage, care for, and forgive each other. As iron sharpens iron, we can help each other actually live out the principles we learn from our study. In our group, we are open to others' ideas, opinions, and preferences, not criticizing. We keep confidences, not gossiping or idly passing on what we heard to others. We pray regularly for each other, allowing God to deepen our love for each one. We encourage others and are encouraged by them, cheering one another on as we share victories and challenges in our walk with God. People should also be inspired by the others in the group. The writer of Hebrews says, let us spur one another on to love and good deeds. In our groups, we focus on each other's gifts and strengths, naming them and suggesting ways they could be used to further the kingdom. We can share what we've learned about God's love, how we've shown or been shown love in practical ways in order to set an example for each other. If a small group stays together long, and if folks are truly friends, inevitably there will be conflict. Hopefully not too big, but personalities will clash. There may be little offenses. This is a place to practice grace and forgiveness. And for other also an that spurring on to love and good deeds. We can remind each other of promises we've made to God and the ways we've agreed to apply the scriptures to our lives. Hopefully, with regular time spent together, maybe eating together, talking, sharing stories of our lives, praying and learning together, small groups will become places full of love and care for each other. In our church, we have deacons who are ordained to take care of the needs of the poor, the sick, and the shut-in, but they have to know who are in those categories at any given time. Small groups are the first line of knowledge and care for folks. And if someone else in the group can't help, they can notify someone in the church, deacons if that's appropriate, or a pastor or elder, to get the help someone in their group needs. If our aim isn't more loving fellowship and care for each of our members, the small groups and the church as a whole aren't doing a very effective job. On the other hand, people in a small group that is effective will experience growing love between the members. It was a real delight to me to hear one of our congregation tell me last week that someone they work with, someone in the community, said they heard that our church is loving toward each other. That is as it should be, and more people should be noticing it. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. If we are truly a discipling church, another of our core values and integral to our mission, we should all be growing in love and good works. Small groups promote this among their members, and so we live Jesus. Still, an active small group focused on growing disciples will not be satisfied with only pers personal growth of its members. Jesus gave the church the great mission in Matthew 28, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so the third part of our vision, share Jesus. A truly loving group will want to expand to include others in that same loving circle. You know how I know? Because God. After Al gave me that amazing sermon yesterday morning, citing Genesis and declaring that Adam and Eve 
were the first small group. At first I said right, and then I said wrong. God is the first small group. The very nature of God, mysterious as this is, is of a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one and three at the same time. A perfectly loving community, each submitting to the other, caring for the other, promoting the other. And out of that beautiful, loving communion, God created the heavens and the earth, culminating with human beings on which to lavish his love. I don't remember who I heard it from. This is not... for community and yet it is God's grace that gives us this community from our beginnings in a family to friendships to marriage to congregations we are not alone God gives us each other what this means for our small groups is that as we grow in love and delight with one another we'll want others to experience that love and delight here in the past couple of years, but I don't actually know how many are active right now. If it's really a core value for our congregation, I'd like to see us ramp it up where almost everyone in the room could say they're involved in some small group that's focused on growing as disciples. If we really believe that this is the best way for our congregation to include everyone in discipleship and reach out to others in the community, more of us will have to buy in. I don't think it has to be too hard, but it will take some doing. It takes two people to decide to make some friends, invite some people to meet somewhere, and intentionally structure the time around spiritual things. Actually, it only takes one person. But even in that, we sometimes need encouragement. Two is better than one. Plus, if one can't attend one time, there's another to organize the meeting. And not every group's meeting has to follow the same format. Some might be primarily Bible study. Although, if this is the case, I encourage you to start with some getting to know you or sharing life time and scheduling in time for prayer for personal requests. Some might hold a prayer meeting with praise songs. Maybe some mothers of small kids will meet at the park and talk more casually, but still intentionally about God. Maybe questions the kids have asked about God, or lessons God is teaching them through their children, things like that. I'm going to bring up the conversations book. Still a great way for two people to enter into a mentoring relationship together. And one night, nice thing about it is that the material is all here. There's no awkward attempts at making spiritual conversation because it's all in here, including Bible verses to read, questions to answer, and practices to do in between meetings. Maybe you're already in a group that meets regularly for a meal or coffee or a committee. Can you start to introduce spiritual conversations instead of just the usual surface stuff? Can you ask for prayer requests from the people there and pray for each one before you leave? Community is built into our faith, and it isn't really optional. The early church receiving the letter to the Hebrews may not have been not meeting out of defiance or some sense of determined independence like we have, the church was being persecuted, and it may have just been safest just not to meet in order to not be detected by the authorities. Even in this case, the author says, no, you need to keep meeting. You need to encourage one another, remind each other of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again, and that he reigns over heaven and earth. That's what it means to build each other up in the faith. But we don't have the excuse of persecution. 
God has graciously given us freedom and time and places to meet and people to meet with and the responsibility to do so. We are here for the sake of each other and for the sake of the world. Only as we live into that will we know, live, share Jesus. Amen. In the spirit of loving community, will you pass the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to one another?